Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to Midday Cafe, and I am your host, along with my fellow hosts, Mike Gennati, and today I am joined by Mark Litwin, Samantha Brown, wait a minute, <laughs> today is Samantha's, Sam's last Midday Cafe, as Sam, I'll let her talk about it in her news segment. But Sam is moving to the mothership and leaving us here all alone. But uh, we're going to be joined uh, today. So it's myself, Mark Litwin. Uh, we have Samantha Brown. And we have our special guest, Bill Bear, that we're going to have today. I just want to welcome everybody. As always with Midday Cafe, we love to hear from you. Please use the uh, chat dialog so that you can go ahead, ask questions, post shout outs. Let us know where you're from. I mean... That'd be cool today to just see who's, you know, the farthest uh, reaching attendee. We get them from all over. So let us know who you are, where you're from, and uh, we'll get to that. I will tell you that we're going to be teeing up questions at the end. But real quickly, for today's Midday Cafe, we have the following. We already uh, we have welcomes and shout outs. We'll start on those momentarily. We also have Microsoft News and Events, and I'm about to kick this on over Two, then we'll move into our feature today, our midday feature. We are very, very happy today to have Mr. Bill Bear uh, with us. And he's going to, oh, my thing was flickering. That was interesting. He is going to be uh, presenting today on all that secret sauce with enterprise search from Microsoft. So we're really looking forward to that. We'll tee all your questions up and then we'll have those at the end of his component, and then we'll wrap up and that we'll call it a day. So without further ado, I believe, oh, just a welcome from Sam. So go ahead, like I said, if you wanna put shout outs, do that. But without further ado, let me kick it on over to our last time co-host, Samantha Thanks, Brown. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> and don't worry, I'm sad to be leaving too, but I'm not going too far. I'm going to the product group uh, for healthcare. You left audio in. <laughs> and we have a technical glitch. Hold on one second. I got her slides. No I need to. There we go. Go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. I was just saying I will uh, really miss being here on this midday cafe as well as missing all of my colleagues too, but the good news is I'll be in the product group in healthcare, so we, I'm not straying too far. We will be working together, but let's get down to business here. I am Sam Brown, and this is the news in two. First up, Microsoft teams up with Volkswagen Group, and we're developing a platform for the agile development of automated driving functions. This will simplify its development process on Microsoft Azure and bring automated driving solutions to the group's cars even faster and allow the automated driving functions to be tested, deployed, and operated. Next up. We mentioned it last time, but it's coming back again, folks, because it's such a big release. Microsoft just launched Viva. It unifies the employee experience across engagement, well-being, learning, knowledge, and all directly in the flow of your work. So our working life is changing, and you want to give your employees everything they need to grow and thrive, all integrated within Teams. I was Next muted up. there. Hold on one sec. You failed oh, yeah. to mention. And also yeah. that all users of Viva automatically will get a free Elvis jumpsuit. Oh, I did forget that piece. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> it's just the little things. <laughs> and that was <laughs> a joke, by the way. <laughs> Uh, all right, back to business. Next up, our Chief Diversity Officer just announced that Microsoft is hosting Include 2021 on March 17th of this year. This is a free global digital event open to all and focused on diversity and inclusion. We're featuring academics, experts in social change, diversity and inclusion, and we're speaking to how we can spark and support lasting cultural change. Sign up today. 
Next up, everyone loves a good feature release. This preview of document translation was designed to translate large files or even batches of them with rich content into 70 plus languages in a variety of file formats. And you can apply custom glossaries, translation models with this custom translator. So check it out and get your documents translated the way that you want. And last, but certainly not least, one week from today, March 1st on Midday Cafe, we're talking Yammer, we're talking community with the man himself, Principal Product Manager, Dan Holm. And this has been Sam Brown reporting live from NYC with the news in two. Stay classy, Midday Cafe. Back to you, Mike. There we go. All right. Transition was a little slow. All right. So um, as we mentioned, we are very excited today to have Mr. Bill Bear. He is a senior product manager. I'll let him give his full title because it appears to have been growing um, even while we were getting him to be a guest on today's show. But he is the guy that knows all the secret sauce going on with enterprise search indexing and the kind of things with the graph, et cetera, that gets served up by that. So without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, and if you've never heard or seen Mr. Bear, you are in for a treat. So let's go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Bill Bear. And Bill, it's all yours. Is it? It is. <laughs> Hey, thanks a lot, and uh, thank you, Sam, for the, the wonderful introduction, the news of the day, um, and throwing in that you'd like to keep it classy. So I will, uh, I'll try to uh, see what I can do and do my best here. Tomorrow's my birthday, just so everybody knows um, in the event that you would like to uh, send cake or presents or, or anything. So let's go ahead and get started. We've got, what, 53 minutes, and we're going to talk about search. So I am going to show you a few slides and then after I show you these few slides we're going to show some demos and then wrap up any questions I will try to get to uh, as I wrap up some of the demonstrations and otherwise. So Microsoft Search, uh, what is Microsoft Search? Well the most important thing to think of uh, with Microsoft Search is it's effectively your native search experience within Microsoft 365 uh, but also available as a standalone solution. So if you visit aka.ms forward slash Microsoft Search, you can learn both about how Microsoft Search is integrated natively into your Microsoft 365 apps and services. In addition, you can also learn about our standalone Microsoft Search offering. So if you're not a subscriber of Microsoft 365, but you still want the awesomeness of Microsoft Search, you can sign up to preview our standalone solution. So before I get started, a little bit of background. Um, why Microsoft Search? Where did it come from? If you think about kind of the history of search at Microsoft, it's it's been a relatively long history that spanned about the last decade or so, um, predominantly beginning with our acquisition of Fast um, in the mid 2000s. So enterprise search at Microsoft has largely been defined by SharePoint on-premises, and that was kind of the preeminent enterprise search solution that Microsoft had offered because it provided connectivity to a variety of different data sources. For example, you know, you could crawl Exchange, you could crawl file shares, you could make that data available via search. And then obviously you could build your own search-driven applications, you could customize the UX and so on and so on. Um, even with that said, if you kind of fast forward about six years from our FAST acquisition and about a year after we integrated uh, FAST as the native engine for SharePoint on-premises, we also acquired Yammer. And if you think about the Yammer acquisition, a lot of people kind of look at that from, from through the lens of, of social networking. But an important piece of Yammer that came along with that acquisition was OpenGraph because it taught us a lot about graph technologies. And really where that becomes important is if you fast forward yet another year from there, that's when we introduce the office graph, but more importantly, a means for you to visualize the potential of graph. And we did that through Office Delve. So there's been kind of this, this disconnected yet connected history from a search perspective at Microsoft. 
Now, if I kind of focus on the former and we talk about disconnected, that's kind of where Microsoft Search comes into the picture. So despite the fast acquisition, despite our innovation in graph technologies, the introduction of Office Delve, one thing we came to recognize about three years ago is across the company, we had a bunch of disparate and fragmented search experiences. So if you wanted to find file sites, news, people, you were relegated to searching in SharePoint. But if you wanted to find email, meetings, and attachments, you would search within Exchange. If you wanted to find conversations, you would search within the context of Yammer. So effectively, again, there was a lot of fragmentation, a lot of disparate search experiences, and we recognized that data doesn't just live in a vacuum. Um, you know, the genesis of any piece of information is, is driven by, you know, related exchanges. So to give you an example of which is, you know, content is created by virtue of conversation in many cases. So an email exchange or a Teams chat or a meeting kind of results in the, the you know, the creation of a file such as a PowerPoint presentation. But, you know, how do you rationalize all of these different exchanges that are interrelated yet subjects may differ? Um, you know, the context may change. So Microsoft Search was designed to kind of address that issue. In addition to that, as we kind of looked across the industry and particularly now, you know, given the nature of, of working from home and the fact that, you know, our hours, our days aren't as structured. Uh, one of the reasons behind that is if you think about it, the conference room was kind of the ultimate gatekeeper to unnecessary meetings because meetings were based on the availability of physical space. You know, and now that everything's going virtual, I mean, you know, there's more and more time we're spending in meetings, we're spending collaborating. And in fact, some of the things that we learned as we started to design Microsoft Search is that people told us that they're spending, you know, upwards of 80% of their day is collaborating, participating in meetings, sending and receiving emails. And then more importantly, you know, when you're collaborating, you need information. You know, you're collaborating about content, about you know, an upcoming meeting about a project that you're working on, an engineering specification. And the one thing as we surveyed our customers that they told us is that about 63% of information workers didn't have confidence um, in decision making based on the available insights that they were getting from search and discovery. And then at the same time, you know, people are telling us, you know, we're finding it more and more difficult to just find information. Almost 60% of people said, I'm struggling to find things. And that's because search hasn't necessarily evolved over the course of the last two decades. You know, search has, has largely kind of lagged in this space of, of keyword based matching. Um, and people want more, you know, than just data. And then at the same time, the other thing that we found is an IDC survey suggested that people spend about 20% of their time searching. Now, if you think about, you know, 20%, it doesn't necessarily sound like, you know, an inordinately large number, but it is if, if you put it in context of workforce. So assume that you have five people on your team. Well, effectively, if you take that 20%, five people on your team, you effectively only have four people on your team because the other one's spending their entire day searching. And then lastly, and most importantly, when it comes to Microsoft Search, the one key thing we wanted to solve is this, this idea or this challenge that we face of continuous interruptions. And we, you know, we found that people are switching tasks almost every 40 seconds. And you, know, you may look and say, no, I don't really switch tasks every 40 seconds. That seems a little bit absurd. But if you think about, you know, particularly during the pandemic and, and the nature of working from home, we are facing continuous interruptions. And some of them may seem relatively benign. So you're sitting here, you're looking at your screen, you're focused on a meeting and, and your phone dings because you get a text or there's a delivery at your door, your dog starts barking, somebody walks across the hallway in front of your office. All of those are minor interruptions, but the cost of those interruptions is relatively immense. Um, you know, psychology suggests that it can take 20 to 25 minutes to truly refocus on the task at hand. And one of the interruptions that we found from a search perspective is that people were relegated to, to switching context in order to search, meaning that when you wanted to find something, you were driven towards some kind of search portal that you would have to go to to execute your search. So you would navigate away from the task at hand, the application that you're working within, and switch to a different application in order to facilitate search. And with Microsoft Search, we want to mitigate some of that context switching and help uh, resolve some of those interruptions. And then the other thing that we see is that, you know, data continues to grow at an exponential rate. 
And it's not just new data that's being created. It's effectively the reuse of data. I'm sure probably everybody watching today has taken a PowerPoint presentation and then adjusted it slightly to facilitate a different conversation. Maybe you're meeting with a different customer and you want to personalize an existing presentation you know, for the context of that conversation. So that's kind of that recreation of data. And we see more and more and more of that. And when you're recreating data, you're effectively, you have your base, you have your, your water and your flour, and then you continue to add more and more ingredients. And you know, how do you get back to that base when you're searching? So, you know, we wanted to design search to kind of solve that challenge, this duplication of data, you know, effectively using search as a mechanism to dedupe content to get you back to, you know, that baseline where you started. And then, you know, the IT role has shifted so much over the last couple of years. I remember talking five, six years ago about how IT was transitioning from being systems administrator to being value added service brokers, meaning, you know, increased focus on addressing the business needs and less focus on patching servers and managing servers. And then, of course, last year when the pandemic started and, and people started working from home, everything shifted and got flipped completely over. We took a complete 180 and IT again was forced to becoming a systems administrator because you needed to keep services up and alive for the remote workforce. And now that we've kind of settled in in this new way of working, you're seeing that transition kind of shift again towards being that value added service broker. You know, how do you empower your users, provide them the right tools and services to facilitate remote work? And then most importantly is individual expectations. People want People want more than just data. You know, the list of blue links was great, an enumerated list of links, and you just kind of click on each one until you find what you need. But people want more than that just enumeration anymore, that just list of links. They want knowledge and they want answers from search. You know, and that's kind of the where employee experience, that's where Viva evolved from, this need to have knowledge. Uh, syntax, you think about the different things that we're introducing across Microsoft 365, and you'll see kind of one key area of focus with each of those products. It's knowledge and answers. You know, it's transitioning away from just delivering data. So where does Microsoft Search fit in? Well, one, we focus on a variety of different things. One, we wanted to understand our customer needs. And those were kind of four core areas that we were able to identify. One, there's a high cost of knowledge transfer and knowledge drain in organizations. People join the workforce, leave the workforce, they bring knowledge with them, but they also take knowledge away. So we wanted to find a way to leverage search to help kind of enable you to harness that collective knowledge of your organization. And then again, coming back to that idea of 63% of people lacking confidence and insights, we wanted to be able to resolve that from search as well. And then one of the coolest things that we're doing, and we'll show you some of this, is the ability to kind of find expertise outside of your immediate team. Typically within your closest cohorts, you kind of know what, what proficiencies those people possess, the people that are closest to you. But when you're looking for skills, proficiencies, and expertise outside of your immediate team, you know, how do you find that? How do you locate those experts that can help you complete a task or a project? And then, you know, one of the real key things is, you know, the one thing that we don't have anymore that was important is those serendipitous encounters in the, you know, that that you know, in the remote workplace. They, you can't replace those encounters remotely. Um, you know, you can help, you know, you can help solve some of those issues through technology, but think about how much work has been done in passing. You know, how much collaboration are just quick exchanges in the hallway or running into somebody in the break room and they remind you that they sent you a file to look at. Hey, Bill, have you had a chance to look at that presentation I sent you yesterday? Or did you look at the Q4 results? from last week. You know, and those those encounters while seemingly benign at the time were actually important, you know, to facilitating that that conversation that drives productivity. So we wanted search to be able to solve that. So, you know, the things that we're kind of hyper focused on now and over the next 6 months and as we move forward with Microsoft Search is really, you know, how do we help people find experts outside of the immediate team? How do we help you identify proficiencies inside of your organization? And topic answers are a great, um, you know, a great kind of starter to doing some of that because, you know, what effectively a topic answer does is it collects the knowledge um, 
not only you know from a content perspective but it also collects you know the related people the related sites the related terms and it packages it all up together so you can find you know the expertise the proficiency the content the things that are trending around a given topic but then we also want to bring together you know conversations and q a because as I mentioned earlier, in the past, you know, every search experience was effectively a small little data silo. And we know that conversations and content are interrelated. So we want to help you rationalize those as one big monolithic entity. And then really key to us is personalization and relevance. So, you know, where does personalization and relevance come from? We're going to talk a little bit about that before we hop into a couple of demonstrations. So first, kind of what is the goal of Microsoft Search? And if I had to summarize it the way that we kind of say it is one capability, every search experience. In fact, when we kind of launched Microsoft Search three years ago and we presented this idea to our leadership team and said, hey, we want to create this new search experience. We want to unify search across Microsoft. We want to deliver a coherent, personalized search experience in all of our apps and services. And you know, our kind of tagline or our mission statement at the time was one search box to rule them all. And if you think about you know, how Microsoft Search functions, there's kind of two key elements, coherence and context. And this is important to understand how search works. So coherence is effectively the idea that Microsoft Search is ubiquitous. It spans all of your apps and services. But most importantly, the thing that we're focused on is not only just coherence, but also context. And context is effectively the user job. You know, what are you trying to accomplish within the app canvas that you're working within? So we kind of separated Microsoft Search into kind of two core elements. Up here at the top, Bing, Office.com, SharePoint, Edge, and Windows. Those are representative of what we call tenant-wide search, organizational search, global search, meaning that via those entry points to Microsoft Search, you can search across the scope of Microsoft 365 app and service data, as well as connected systems via our graph connectors. Below the line are our, our, our context-driven experiences, meaning that in PowerPoint, Outlook, OneDrive, Stream, Yammer, Word, Teams, OneNote, and more, search is designed to work in context. You know, what's the user job? What are you trying to do? So in PowerPoint, you know, we're not going to show you email conversations, or we're not going to show you ServiceNow data, ServiceNow knowledge bases, or data you know, from a SQL Server connection. We're going to show you Office data. We're going to show you PowerPoint presentations. We're going to show you Word documents. We're going to show you Excel files. We really want to focus on context. We don't want to create a bunch of clutter in search. So, you know, a lot of people ask, well, you know, I'm searching inside of office.com and I can see files, sites, news, conversations, Power BI reports, images, and more. But when I search inside of Outlook, I'm not seeing all of those same things. And that's coherence versus context. Because in Outlook, in all likelihood, you're searching for email conversations. You're searching for meetings and attachments. You're not necessarily searching for a SharePoint site. So we want to unclutter search while at the same time giving you powerful search across your apps and services. So where does that power come from? Well, one, as we designed Microsoft Search, not only did we build it on an entirely new search stack, but then we fronted it with the Microsoft Graph because we recognized that we had this unparalleled foundation um, of knowledge at Microsoft. We had this truly unique and vast data set that represents world knowledge. And you can think about that as being, you know, the two and a half billion entities in Bing. It represents organizational knowledge, the, you know, the 200 million plus Office 365 subscribers. And then most importantly, individual knowledge, you know, the 500 million LinkedIn members. So we had this, you know, this unparalleled data set that we had to work with. So we fronted it with the Microsoft graph. And that's where personalization comes from as well. You know, we reason across all of that user behavior, those collaborative patterns. For every individual that's using our services, we generate over 200 different signals, passive and active signals that exist between an anchor, an individual, and an object, a piece of information. So who worked with who? Who shared a file with who? Who, who collaborated last on this file? What's the organizational relationship between these, these two individuals? Have they recently met? Have they had an email exchange? Have they chatted together in teams? And using all of those signals, we can build a profile of an individual and then personalize the search results and tailor them to you. 
If you think about traditional search that was predominantly based on simple keyword matching logic, the search results were effectively the same for everybody. And we know we're all unique, we're all individuals. And the idea behind Microsoft Search is leverage the global perspective of the graph to, to deliver truly unique search results to every individual in the organization, you know, respecting how they work and who they are. And then also what's important about the graph is that is our to relevance tuning mechanism for search. Traditional search provided a lot of knobs and switches in respect to tuning relevance. And we use the graph as our relevance tuning mechanism. And the reason that we do so is because we believe that traditional relevance tuning, the idea of arbitrarily boosting content from, from a search perspective, sacrifices the needs of the individual for the good of the greater. So, you know, what we focus on is the latter. We really want to focus on the needs of the individual. Albeit, we do have this concept of search answers that we'll talk about here in a moment and demonstrate in the latter half of this conversation. So what is Microsoft Search again? To kind of summarize, one, it's complementary to your Microsoft 365 subscription. It's the native search experience that powers your apps and services in Microsoft 365. How do you know that you have Microsoft Search available to an app or service? Well, if the search box is in the Office 365 suite nav, front and center, that's Microsoft Search. So one of the key things that we did from a visual indicator perspective is we moved the search box from the app canvas to the Office 365 suite nav. That's the visual cue that you have Microsoft Search available to you. And then second, it's built within the boundaries of Microsoft 365. So it adheres to the same trust and compliance principles. So that was important to us um, to be able to leverage the work that those teams do with Microsoft Search. And then, you know, third, the idea behind Microsoft Search is we really wanted to create an ego expressive experience. We wanted to take search beyond just being utilitarian value and turn it into another productivity tool at Microsoft. So the idea behind it is search is going to continue to evolve to where it truly becomes a productivity tool. It's, it's another tool that you can use to help facilitate collaboration, not just find information. And then unified administration of search and discovery. One of the key things that you probably saw is the Microsoft Search Admin Console became the Search and Intelligence Admin Console because the idea is, is we're going to evolve search. And you know it's not going to be just data, again, knowledge and answers. And then at the same time, we haven't lost sight on the things that people used to do. Customization, extensibility. So we have PNP Modern Search, um, we have the SharePoint Framework, we have Graph APIs, all of these things to enable you to not only query across the data that you have, not only in M365, but your connected systems using our APIs, but then truly customize some of those experiences using the SharePoint Framework, um, using modern parts, but even more WYSIWYG approaches. So here in the next few weeks, um, coming to targeted release, we're going to be shipping the ability to customize verticals and customize refiners um, and filters. So you have more customization opportunities around Microsoft Search as well. So before we get into some demos, if you think about what Microsoft Search gives you from an entity perspective, you get files and apps, contextual and relevant, including Power BI artifacts. You get people, and this is most important because people are, is one of those things that I like to think about when I think about search, and I'll kind of show you some of this and why it's important to us. Conversations, sites, answers, resources, groups, locations, floor plans. You get a ton of cool stuff with Microsoft Search. So without further ado, let's go ahead and just look at some of these baseline capabilities that you have available to you. Uh, so here, I'm just going to go ahead and reshare. Bear with me for one moment. All right, so here we are in SharePoint uh, in Office 365. So you know everybody's probably familiar with SharePoint Home, but let's go ahead and look at a few things that Microsoft Search does. Um, one is, again, leveraging the global perspective of the graph. How do we do that in a variety of different ways? The first thing that you'll see when you click in the search box is zero query. Uh, our zero query experience is designed to get you back to the most recent content and people that you've collaborated with. 
So you can think about this as, as addressing some of the continuous interruption. So when you need to get back to that file or that person, the news or sites you've most recently interacted with, a simple click in the search box brings that right to you. So the next step is let's go ahead and do a couple of queries. Um, here, I'm just gonna type in HHS and you're gonna see a couple of things. Up at the top, for those unfamiliar with Search and SharePoint or Microsoft Search are what we call verticals. Verticals are a way to distill data down to a specific entity type. So in the event that I just wanna see files that satisfy the intent of this query, I can use a vertical to do so. The files vertical, <clears throat> it collates files related to that given query. Sites, obviously sites, people, news, Power BI, are reports related to that query. Uh, I have a media wiki connected as well as a test vertical. But if you think about what a vertical represents is again, it's a way to limit the scope of the search results down to a specific entity. And then down below, you can filter further by file type or last modified, depending on the vertical that you're using uh, to represent the search results. Now, as I mentioned, coming to targeted release here at the end of the month, you'll be able to customize these verticals out of the box verticals, as well as create new verticals based on SharePoint OneDrive content in addition to being able to customize these filters. So maybe you have an attribute that you wanna filter on such as author, you can add that attribute. So here are ranked results down at the bottom. So as I scroll through, this is representative of ranked results. Up here at the top, this is unique to Microsoft Search. This is what we call an answer. And effectively what an answer is, is it's a way for you to address user intent. Now, earlier I said that we leverage the graph as our relevance tuning mechanism because we believe that arbitrarily influencing results, again, sacrifices the needs of the individual for the good of the greater. However, via this concept that we call answers, we allow you to do um, promotion of authoritative resources. So we allow you to effectively create an authoritative resource and present that above the ranked results. Now answers come in a variety of different fashions. Um, you can have bookmark answers, Q&A answers, location answers, people answers, floor plan answers, um, file answers, calendar answers, depending on where you're searching from. But basically how do answers work? One, you can configure answers in uh, the Microsoft Search Admin Center or the Search and Intelligence Admin Center. In this particular case, this is a bookmark answer. The intent of a bookmark answer is to get me to the most authoritative resource as defined by the organization or the search administrator. So they've promoted this U U United States Department of Health and Human Services link as along with its website as the most authoritative resource that satisfied the intent of this query. So when I triggered the keywords, triggered on the keywords HHS, I'm provided a bookmark answer. But what if I say, what are common cold symptoms? I ask search a question. Ooh, I can spell, I'm getting there. Now you'll notice here, I actually got an answer to my question from search. This is called a Q&A answer. So I've showed you two answers now, a bookmark answer and a Q&A answer. Now the difference between the two is a bookmark answer is intended to be generated when the query is expressed as a set of keywords, such as HHS. A Q&A answer conversely is intended to trigger when the query is expressed as a question. So in this particular case, I expressed my query as a question. So as you can see, I got an answer for what are common cold symptoms. So not only do I have a nicely formatted answer, but I also have a link to where I can learn more, the Mayo Clinic link. Now I can also express my query using predecessors such as define or what is. Now in this particular case, I get a completely different answer. This is what's called an acronym answer. Acronym answers come in, can be generated in two ways. The top acronym answer that you see published by Contoso is what we call a curated answer, meaning that this answer was created by the search administrator. They defined US Department Health and Human Services as an option for the acronym HHS. But you'll notice down below, there's also what we call a mind answer, Health and Human Services from file, and there's a link to a PDF. This is an AI mind answer. So we deliver answers in two ways. You can create them 
or our algorithm goes out, reasons across all of your content, files, email conversations, and it identifies answers. And it promotes those answers to the search administrator, those acronyms. And you can either publish those or you can uh, decline to publish those. Here in the next few weeks, we're gonna add what we call acronym exclusions. So let's say the system identifies an acronym in a document, but you don't wanna publish it. You wanna exclude it and all of its children. We're gonna allow for exclusion of those acronyms as well. And then acronyms also surface up in app experiences such as Word. But let's go ahead and come back to bookmark answers. So bookmark answers, a couple, some of the work that we're doing here is we're also gonna recommend bookmark answers as well. So today you can create bookmark answers as a search administrator, but they're not AI mined. Here in the next few weeks, we're gonna add a mining algorithm to those and we're gonna look across your SharePoint content and we're gonna recommend to the administrator, hey, you should promote this particular SharePoint site or page as a bookmark answer. And then you'll have the ability to publish those. And then even furthermore, um, let's say what are common cold symptoms and I'm gonna come back to this one real quick. Even furthermore, we're also going to recommend Q and A's as well. So here in the next few months, the, the uh, two former the next few weeks, but in the next few months, you can imagine if you have documents stored inside of SharePoint or OneDrive, FAQ documents, we're gonna reason across those documents and recommend Q and A's to the search administrator so you can publish those. So if you have a bunch of Q and A documents floating around the organization, we're gonna allow our algorithm to reason across all of those Q and A's and we'll promote them to the search administrator for publication. So you can look across them and say, oh wow, that's a really great idea. I'm gonna publish this one because users in the organization are asking a lot of questions about that. So I'm gonna come back real quick to uh, a couple of different queries here I'll show you. So I'm gonna do a Mark 8 query real quick. Uh, the other thing that we're gonna be doing here is what we call uh, results clusters. So you'll notice here I have, again, a, a Q&A answer, but down here you're gonna notice I have this remote, this um, results cluster. So in the past, you're probably familiar with these verticals where if you connect to ServiceNow or a MediaWiki or a file share, um, you are relegated to kind of clicking on this vertical in order to search across its data. But now we're gonna be introducing what we call a results cluster for graph connector data, meaning that you can see wiki data in context with your M365 content, as well as your promoted authoritative answers. So now let's kind of get into a few other things. Um, and this is one of my favorites, expertise search. So this is really cool in that you're probably familiar with the Microsoft 365 profile, the LPC, the live profile card. But what's really cool is the ability to search and reason across expertise inside of the organization. If you remember earlier, I talked about how finding expertise outside of your immediate team is hard. And one of the things that we want to do address with Microsoft Search was uh, resolving this challenge that organizations faced with knowledge drain and knowledge transfer. One of the ways that we're doing that is by enabling you to find experts within the organization um, by searching across their profile. So in this particular case, when I search for an expert in social media, I'm presented with Alex Wilbur. So it's an easy way for me to find expertise in the organization, that tacit knowledge that I didn't know existed before search was able to reason it across it. Now, how does this work? Two ways. Um, one is we reason across the, the PAPI attributes, the UPA attributes, the profile attributes that are um, synonymous with SharePoint's UPA. Um, so those skills and expertise that you would add in your, your Delve profile, that's where most people kind of create that affinity between expertise and, and profile data. But we also have an algorithm that we call expertise location. And effectively what it does is it reasons across patterns of behavior and it makes what we call or it suggests inferred knowledge. So we're able to look across, say, Alex's email and documents, and we're able to create a set of inferred skills and proficiencies about Alex that we can incorporate into Alex profile to make Alex more discoverable when people search for expertise. Now, why do that? If you think about expertise, expertise has largely been centered on this idea of self attestation I can go out and declare I have a proficiency in anything. 
um, there are no checks and balances. There are no ways to validate or, or qualify my expertise, my skills, my proficiency. So for example, I could go out to a job sharing site today and I could declare that I have a proficiency in neurosurgery and there's really no check or balance to, to indicate otherwise or you know, other than you know the individual's own integrity. But beyond that, let's assume that 10 years ago, um, I used to possess a proficiency in Perl or Python, and I haven't worked with it in the last eight. Well, that may not necessarily be a proficiency that I actually possess anymore, but there's nothing that incentivizes me to remove that from my profile. So by creating this inferred knowledge, we can create this up-to-date, rich, dynamic, and robust profile experience through which we can help people keep their profiles up to date. We won't go out there and arbitrarily remove any skills. We won't arbitrarily even add skills. What we'll do is suggest to Alex, hey, we've, you know, we've noticed that you collaborate frequently on this, or, or we've, uh, you know, we've discovered that you may have a proficiency in the Mark 8 quadricopter. Would you like to add it to your profile? So we prompt Alex to add that to his profile. So it becomes an ego expressive experience. It's something fun to do. Um, so here in SharePoint, again, uh, a variety of different things that you can do from an answers, answers perspective. One more answer we can take a quick look at is this concept that we call a location answer. So if I search for HHS headquarters, I get a nice little map. I can expand that and then I can actually get directions by clicking on this link. So again, if you think about you know, why all of this exists, Again, to mitigate context switching and really to turn search into a productivity tool. You'll notice here we have a custom refiner that we created called author. So I can actually filter this down by author. Now coming back to people and why people are so important. Let's go back to Alex real quick. Uh, we're going to look up Alex Wilbur. Why is people search so important? Well, if you think about the things that you remember, it's places and faces. Those are the things that we recall. Nobody recalls the file that they worked on two weeks ago. Um, you know, if I had to ask you, what are the last 15 files that you worked on in the last month? It'd be hard for you to come up with the names, the exact names of 15 files that you worked on in the last month. You may remember one or two keywords because you're probably focused on one or two projects. But if I asked you, you know, who are the last 15 people you talked to? Chances are that you can recall more of them than you can files. So places and faces are the things that we remember. So why is that important from a search perspective? Well, if I had to create an analogy, let's think of puzzles. From you know childhood on, the way that we're taught to build a puzzle is we're given a box. We're taught to open one end of the box and dump it on a table. And then we're taught to separate all the straight edges and right angles to one side of the table and everything that's not a straight edge or a right angle to the other side of the table. Now, using this analogy, let's, let's say that the, the outer edges, the right angles, the straight edges are representative of information. And those that aren't right edges or, or right angles, those are representative of people. Now, if you think about the most important part of the puzzle, it's the center, the person, because it's the person that creates and curates knowledge. So the way that we build puzzles, if you kind of use this search analogy, is we work from the outer edges, the information inward towards the individual. With Microsoft Search, we want to allow you to build the puzzle both ways, working from the outer edges inward, but also from the inner edges outward towards the information trending around an individual. Why is that important? Let's say, you know, in this case of Alex, um, let's go back to Alex Wilbur real quick. Let's say a couple of weeks ago, um, Alex and I were in a meeting with about 15 other people. Maybe this was back in September and Alex presented this file during the meeting called Mark 8 Marketing Campaign. Well, here we are, you know, in February. This meeting was in September. So what do I remember about that meeting? Well, I remember Alex presented a file about Mark 8 marketing. OK, so here's what we do. We go to search and we search for Mark 8 marketing. As you can see, I'll get hundreds, if not thousands of results related to Mark 8 marketing. So, you know, how do I find that file that Alex presented back in September? And the only things that I remember or it was about Mark 8, it was about marketing. So the first thing that we traditionally do is we try to search for those keywords and we get hundreds if not thousands of results. But again, coming back to this concept of places and faces, I do remember that Alex presented that file during that meeting. So how much more quickly can I find it? I just search for Alex, I click on Alex, I go to files, 
and then I find the shared file for market marketing campaign that he presented back in September. A much faster way to get back to those things that's important. And again, as I mentioned, search comes in kind of two different flavors, org wide as well as app specific. So here in office.com, I could do the same thing. Alex, go to Alex Wilbur. And then when I get Alex, go to files and I will get that same file. So office.com is one of those places, again, where I can search across the organization and connected systems. So if I search for Mark 8 here, you'll see that I have those same verticals available to me. And then as I mentioned, Bing is yet another place. So if you're signed in with a work account, you can come into Bing and you can search for Mark 8 and you'll get under your work vertical or those same verticals and refiners as well as the same answers. So as you can see, I have my bookmark answer here. I have my wiki results cluster here and then all of my ranked results here. But then I also talked about this concept called in-app search. What is in-app search? Well, in-app search is let's say I'm uh, working in the context of Word. As you can see, search box front and center. Um, what are our primary goals? So here in Word, we have what we call smart find. I can search within the context of Word, narrow that query down to files, and look at that. I have an answer to a question based on content stored within the document. So how do we, how does this smart find thing work? You're probably familiar if you're using SharePoint or OneDrive with this concept called at a glance or inside look. When you hover over a file, you get a document summary. Where do those document summaries come from? They come from a model we use at Microsoft called Turing NLG. Turing NLG is a transformer based generative language model. It's a 17 billion parameter model that provides for natural language processing and machine reading comprehension. What does that all mean? Well, to kind of you know distill it down, basically what it does is it can finish um, incomplete sentences and it can create document summaries and generate answers from document content with human parity. So we trained this model against Stanford squad data set. It's a question and answering data set where Stanford crowdsources individuals to read and respond to Wikipedia passages. Then companies like Microsoft train our models against that with the idea of being how close can we get to human parity? So in this particular case, our Turing model was able to generate an answer from document content to my question with human parity. If you read this, um, you know, if you think about GTP, very similar. We're able to generate these, these document summaries and answer questions again with human parity. Our primary goal for package design in this release is not just to showcase product, but connect with our customer. So I was able to simply answer that question. So let's look at a few more things our Turing model can do. I'm going to share screens again. And in this particular case, Bill, Bill, yeah. I just, I, just, I got to ask, ask. Mm -hmm. because, because you said, you said Turing, Turing, and then, yeah, you're, then talking you're talking about, about you, know, you know, similar, similar to, to human. human. Yeah. Is that what that's called? That's called? Yeah, it's, yeah, so it's it's kind of, you know, the, the name the name is, is a you know, our Turing NLG is obviously it's a namesake, Alan Turing, um, and then the Turing test. And in the Turing test is, you know, the intent behind that was to, you know, to determine the intelligence of machines comparative to, to human knowledge. So our Turing model um, is designed um, specifically to perform some of that while at the same time, um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a very large model, it's extensive. We believe uh, prior to, to our Turing model, again, a 17 billion parameter model, the largest model that existed was a billion parameters. So, you know, the question becomes is, well, it seems like across the industry, everybody's looking at smaller models. Well, our belief is the bigger the model, the more easily it is to train. Um, and that's why we, we, you know, we're focused on this concept of large models. So we believe that transfer learning, you know, our ability to train models against one data set and then bring it to another data set is far more efficient than smaller models. Um, Turing is a derivative of deep speed. So um, we open source deep speed, 100 million parameter model. So you can look for deep speed online. Um, you can find it there. If you're interested in Turing, you can search for MS Turing um, or just go to msturing.org and you can see some of the cool stuff that we're doing with Turing. Now, what's really cool um, is to give you an example is we're gonna be bringing Turing to SharePoint, office.com and Bing. So all of those global entry points, the org wide entry points, the Turing model's coming to those. So to give an example here, we're gonna go to Bing um, 
So here in Bing, um, you know, one of the ones that we like to do is, uh, can I bring my dog to work? So I'm going to go ahead and search. And as I showed you in Bing earlier, you have this work vertical um, or you have work results. So here signed in with my work account. There's a bill up here in the corner. Um, you can see as a rule, pets can't be brought to Microsoft. The only animals allowed in Microsoft building are service animals or support animals formally approved through the medical accommodation process, pets in the workplace company policy. Now, there's a couple of things that, that Turing does that we're going to be bringing to SharePoint one in OneDrive content. Um, of those things, one, it provides semantic understanding. Our Turing model is capable of understanding that, say, a Tesla is synonymous with an electric vehicle. It's smart enough to understand that a dog is synonymous with a pet, but it's also intelligent enough to understand the full intent of the query that's expressed. Now, to give you, to give you an example, if you think about traditional search and I ask what wine pairs best with salmon, I'm going to get results for wine, results for salmon, or no results at all. Um, with Turing, if I ask what wine pairs best with salmon, we look at that in context. We take the entire query that's expressed and we generate a result based on that. So in this particular case, can I bring my dog to work? Not only did it understand that dog is synonymous with pets, but it also workplace company policy. So it understands the intent of my query in, in its full completeness. Now, what's really cool is you'll notice that this company policy document link pops up here. Why? Because this using machine reading comprehension is actually a passage that exists in the document that we excerpt and provide as an answer to my question. So basically using machine reading comprehension, we looked at this query, we found the related passage in a policy document, and we presented it as an answer with human parity. So if you read this, this is effectively generated with human parity. So we were able to take the content of that document, structure it as an answer, and bring that back. And this is some of the cool stuff that's coming to your content in SharePoint and OneDrive. So you can imagine one day you're sitting in SharePoint and you can ask a question like, what were our Q4 results compared to our Q3 results in fiscal year 19 for historical purposes? And we can generate a summary of all of that data to give you an answer. Um, another way we can look at this is, let's say, um, well, let me ask another question like, um, how many days can I take off for jury duty? And jury duty company policy, if you were called for jury duty, and you are an exempt employee, you can take up the 10 days off without deduction from your salary. So as you can see, again, it's reading from documents and generating an answer to my question. Now, you know, where Turing also gets really cool is it also can deliver people answers. So I showed you the Alex Wilbur people answer. Um, but let's say, you know, I'm trying to find uh, somebody named Sophia who's an engineer. Um, so, you know, I, I need to try to find this person. So the first thing that we might do is say, Sophia, Okay, Sophia Miller. This is the most relevant Sophia Miller to me based on what the graph understands about me. So as you can see in this particular case, this is a director of communications. Okay, well, that's not the Sophia I'm looking for. I'm looking for Sophia the engineer because somebody told me I needed to talk to her. So now I have Sophia Vergaris, software engineer. I'm getting closer, but the thing that I know is that the Sophia I want to talk to is in London. So Sophia, the engineer in London. And there we go, Sophia Moda, Senior Software Engineering Manager in MSAI. So that happens to be the organization that I work in, MSAI, Microsoft Search Assistant in Intelligence. And as uh, Mike uh, brought up earlier, one of the roles that I've taken on most recently is Cortana and Embedded AI, um, because we really, again, wanna turn search into a productivity tool. So if you think about what search does today, it does find. If you think about what Cortana does, do. We want to pull together this concept of finding and doing into one experience. So you can imagine search again becoming not only a discovery tool, but a productivity tool because we know that if you're looking for something, you want to do something with that something. If you're looking for your car keys, it's because you want to drive somewhere. Um, you have a need for the data that you seek. And our idea is the closer we can bring Cortana as your workplace assistant to search, then as you seek, we're going to prompt you to do. 
to take action against that content. So one last thing I'll show you, given that we have five minutes left, um, is we also support natural language and it's coming in phases. So I'm just gonna switch screens again and there's so much stuff to show you. And I know I'm moving super fast uh, this morning. Um, I could spend all day talking about some of the cool stuff coming, but let's go ahead, pop into here real quick. And I'm going to go into Outlook real quick because coming to Outlook and coming to Microsoft Teams, we're going to be bringing natural language search, which will also be coming to SharePoint and Office.com and the rest of our search entry points over the course of time. So what's natural language search? Well, one, it's search that speaks your language. So today, how many of you have done this? From, oh, sorry, let me go ahead and close this. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I'm just going to discard this real quick. How many of you have clicked in your search box and Outlook and typed from colon? I'm willing to bet that 90% of you, when you were looking for email from somebody, have typed from colon in the search box. But what we're bringing to search is something better because from colon, that's not you know speaking your language. That's speaking the machine's language. We want search to work the way that you work. So what we're doing is bringing show me email from Megan. And there are all the emails from Megan Bowen, uh, but I want only the emails with attachments. Show me emails from Megan Bowen with attachments. Um, or let's say show me email from Nestor about teamwork, for example. And there are the emails from Nestor that are about teamwork um, or maybe, you know, my next meeting and it'll reason across my calendar and show you know my next meeting if i have one i can even search for stuff like my next one-on-one -on -one, and it'll bring that up or you know show me email from uh, november to december and it'll go across and it'll bring up all the emails from november to december so as you can see now it's filtering my email from november to December. So, you know, some of the really cool stuff that's uh, coming is natural language because, again, we want search to be able to speak the same language that you speak to make it easier for you to find and discover information. So, we're going to start out in the next few weeks by bringing natural language search to Outlook and Teams. And then, as we move into kind of the second half of the year, we're looking at SharePoint and OneDrive content. And if you can imagine what that means, is you can go into SharePoint and say, show me files about Q4 marketing um, between this date and this date, or show me PowerPoint presentations about the Contoso Mark 8 Quadrocopter from Mike or authored by Mike. So some really cool stuff coming there as well. And again, you know, I kind of showed you some healthcare examples too, where, you know, you can search for stuff like what are common cold symptoms. Well, you can imagine as soon as we start incorporating Turing into your office content, then you, it'll be able to derive the answer to your question from a document. So if you say, you know, what, what is an asymptomatic carrier? And if you have a medical document, you know, something that's generated by Moderna or Pfizer, um, you know, that contains information about that, because we can reason across that document, Turing will go out, find the answer in the document, present it in search. Again, turning it into a productivity tool and an awesome and powerful Q&A database. So that was kind of just tip of the iceberg, some of the cool stuff that you can do with search. Um, we update our roadmap on a quarterly basis. Most typically, the next roadmap update is coming on Friday. So if you check out our public roadmap for search, aka.ms forward slash Microsoft search forward slash roadmap, um, you can find a filtered Microsoft search roadmap there. If you refresh it on Friday afternoon, you're going to see our roadmap throughout the next half of this year, and you're going to see some really cool stuff coming um, across all of the different entry points, both in typed queries as well as in voice as we bring the the workplace assistant closer to search um, as well as a lot of the stuff that you've been asking for some exciting announcements coming here in the next few weeks at our spring ignite um, and then as we kind of work our way into build we're really going to unleash some awesome innovation um, that's coming so you know where's the relationship to viva where's the relationship to syntax syntax and viva all draft off of microsoft search they're built on top of Microsoft Search. So get started with Microsoft Search because that creates the foundation for all of these other new products we're uh, delivering. Um, now, topic answers that you probably saw with Viva and Syntax, you probably remember me in the very beginning talking about search answers, locations, bookmarks, acronyms, Q&As, floor plans. 
um, people, files, those answers that I showed you, a topic answer is a search answer. The difference is, is it's related to Viva, it's related to syntax, and one key difference with topics is it takes and collates all of that related information. So in my particular case, I searched for expertise in social media. I found Alex. I searched for HHS. HHS. I got bookmarks. I got files. Um, I searched for define HHS and I got an acronym and a description. So three different searches produced, you know, three different answers. A topic answer is effectively a name and description and related content. It takes those Microsoft search answers and packages them up into one consistent, coherent answer that brings together the acronyms, the people, and the related content. And it does that through our knowledge graph. So really cool stuff uh, with Viva as well. That said, we have reached one o'clock Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. So I'm gonna stop there, um, turn it back over to Mike. And let me, let go, me ahead go ahead and share. share. And we should have. Do you have time for any questions? I guess that's the that's the question. <laughs> You're on mute, Bill. That never happens. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's see. If you want to pick, I've got a few minutes. If you want to pick, maybe like your top five. Let's see. And I'm answering sure, a question sure. now I'll, on the search roadmap. I'll leave that to uh, Mark. Mark, do you want to tee those up? Couple of them. Yeah, we'll, we'll group a bunch together and get it in in a few minutes here. Um, so we have about 10 questions. Awesome stuff, by the way. But, um, but one of the questions came up around search kind of feels different across the applications. And I, I can't imagine the challenge you have as well. And, you know, mentioned some of the legacy with Outlook and people expect to talk like a computer to it. And, um, but it, you know, it does like you look at Outlook Teams and SharePoint, it's like three different search things. Where do you guys think in there and, and how's it going to change? Yeah. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, and I'm, I'm going to answer this question with two different answers. Um, and, uh, Sorry, I'm getting pinged about some stuff. Um, there are, I, I posted a, a URL to kind of my personal blog, which is basically an extension of my work blog. Um, every once in a while, there's like cat and dog stuff. But if you if you visit my personal blog and you search for co context versus coherence, I got a pretty good description there that's, that's detailed, probably too long to summarize here. But the reason search is different is twofold. In the beginning, I talked about coherence versus context. Um, coherence is the idea that Microsoft Search powers search in all of your apps and services across Microsoft 365. Context, however, is the setting. So the thing that we kind of focus on is in Outlook, um, that's, you know, it's contextual search. We want to show you information related to the user job. What are you trying to accomplish in Outlook? Um, and the type of work that you do in Outlook, email, um, meetings, sometimes people. So in Outlook, we, we center the search results on that type of content. We don't want to clutter the results in Outlook by showing you files, sites, news, ServiceNow, Wikipedia type stuff. We want to focus on, on that app and what you do inside of that app. Now, conversely, we have those tenant-wide search scopes, SharePoint, Office.com, and Bing. Now, those three are, are scoped to be tenant wide because those are representative of what we call our web entry points, meaning that you, you know, versus app entry points, those are our web entry points. The reason you, search, you can search tenant wide there is because they lack any kind of context. So in office.com, you know, it's representative of information across Microsoft 365, so you should be able to search across it. In Bing, it doesn't have any kind of app context, so we show results from everywhere. Um, now, the second part of that question is probably, you know, why does it, you know, look so different? It's jarring to a certain extent. When I'm looking at Bing, Office.com, and SharePoint, the UX is is fundamentally different across all three of those. The good news is, is, is we are working on a project that we call a shared SERP, SERP meaning search engine results page. That shared SERP will align the search engine results page across SharePoint, Office.com, and Bing. Furthermore, customizations that you apply to SharePoint 
when we have a shared cert will be applicable to Bing in, in office.com as well. So then you'll have more consistency from a UX perspective across those tenant wide scoped search entry points. So that's on the roadmap um, that's coming. We're definitely addressing that. Um, there was a question related to Teams too, when the new search is coming to Teams. Um, as we move towards the second half of this year, we're going to be shipping a new full page modern SERP to Microsoft Teams. So today, Microsoft Teams search is kind of limited to that right rail experience, that left rail experience. The, the new full page modern search engine results page is going to be uh, very similar to what you see in office.com and SharePoint and Bing. So it'll be more representative of tenant wide information, but you're going to get a cool full page search. And then over the course of time, we'll also start to incorporate that that connector data as well. So then teams will become more of an org wide search entry point as well, because we know people are doing a lot of their work today on a day to day basis um, inside of teams. So I wanted to answer that question when I saw it. So I'll let you uh, ask maybe two more, Mark. Fair enough. Um, so there was another question around uh, that um, uh, inferred skills, uh, you know, super cool thing there. And uh, you showed a lot of kind of you know, hinted towards where that's going, maybe with Viva uh, oh, and hey, Sue. Um, will, will that be something that's just included with what they have today? Or do you see that, you know, becoming part of uh, Viva topics or, or what does that look like? Everything you showed is, you know, should they expect yeah, that? So skills will come in, in kind of two different formats. Um, there is there is kind of two two different ways that we're going to be shipping that. Um, one is just natively out of the box complementary, the ability to search skills. So in that in in that particular scenario, that enables people, much as you can do today, to add skills and proficiencies and interests to your profile. <clears throat> so you know inside of the LPC, the live profile card, you have an option today to add skills to your profile. Um, out of the box, we're going to allow you to search for those skills. That's going to be self attestation. Um, if you think about this concept of inferred skills, that will likely be packaged with like Viva or Syntax. The inferred skills difference is that's where we actually reason across data and generate a set of inferred skills. Now, the inferred skills work isn't just limited to the inference of skills. It has a bunch of other touch points or tentacles, um, and those tentacles include you know, building people into topic experiences, you know, um, generating data via knowledge in Viva. So it's not just skills. It's going to be, you know, more than just inferred skills. Inferred skills is just one small piece of the pie. All right, last question. There were uh, a few kind of on the, the admin side of things. Almost yep. um, can't tell if uh, wasn't familiar with the admin, uh, you know, tools available for search and, you know, how do I turn on, you know, the Bing results for Microsoft yep. search? Um, you know, where do people get started? What What's, um, you know, how do people approach this that you've seen? Yeah, so a um, couple of different ways um, that you can get started is, we have a couple of different places you can go. Uh, one is if you go to HK, AKS.MS, I'm pasting it in the in the uh, chat right now. Um, this is our Tech Community Resource Center. Um, there's a set of adoption materials. So if you go to that resource center, there's a link for adoption. It'll take you to some adoption materials that we continue to update um, and create also some blog posts. Um, you can download illustrations, PowerPoint presentations as more. There's also a link there to our Knowledge Virtual Hub. So if you search on uh, the Microsoft tech community for virtual hub, you'll find a variety of different virtual hubs, one for Azure, one for SQL Server, one for Windows. There's one for knowledge and you'll find a ton of videos and content about Microsoft Search and SharePoint syntax um, collectively that can get you started. Um, the, the kind of uh, one question that I did see in here is somebody asked how I got the work results in Bing. Um, basically, if you're authenticated using your work or school account, um, you'll get work results in Bing unless your organization has disabled that particular piece of functionality. In addition to that, if you're signed into Edge with a work or school account and you open up a new, a new tab, you'll get the NTP or new tab page, which also includes work um, data as well. Um, some things that are coming is a lot of people ask like, OK, well, what's the story with SharePoint search? Because in the SharePoint Admin Center, I still have search controls. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned very early in the conversation, SharePoint was built on top of the fast stack um, when we integrated in 2013 and Microsoft search is built on a net new stack um, 
that doesn't have an affinity to fast or anything else. It's, it's a completely novel stack that we built for Microsoft Search. A key piece of work we're doing over the next months, years, is migrating from that traditional fast index in SharePoint Online to the Microsoft Search stack. So you've probably seen some recent deprecations around SharePoint Online Search. That's because we're shifting its functionality over to Microsoft Search. One of the near-term things that you're going to see is when you go into your SharePoint sites here in April, uh, you have the ability to generate search usage reports. Those are going to redirect to Microsoft Search search usage reports. Um, so basically, we're doing a lot of work to take a lot of that fast functionality that you've come to love and enjoy and bring that into Microsoft Search. So you have one unified place to manage search across all of your M365 entry points. Uh, one other place, if you do have any questions, um, you can either send me a tweet at, at William Bear. Happy to collaborate with you there. If you do have questions, I don't mind. You know, most people don't do this, but my email address is in there as well. Um, you know, don't be shy. I'm more than happy. I mean, it's what they they pay me to do search. So if you have a question about search, you are more than welcome uh, to send me an email. Um, I try to respond to all of them. It's just a matter of time but I will, uh, I'll definitely get to your email. So, you know, if you wanna reach out on, on Twitter, social media, I'm more than happy to help answer questions there. If you wanna send me a note um, via email, I, I'm definitely more than happy to respond and answer any questions. If you want to, you know, inquire about setting up a meeting, let's say, you know, you're representing your company and you happen to catch this webinar, shoot me an email. I'll be glad to, you know, talk to your, your organization um, and, and do some demos and show you some of the art of the possible and, and what you can do. All that right. Doesn't apply to, that doesn't apply to my Microsoft friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, hey, first of all, this has been great. So, Bill, we want to thank you for coming on. Uh, all the engagement that uh, went on around this. I'm going to mute that audio. Well, there we go. And uh, you know, this has been a great session. We will have the recording from today's session will be posted live uh, with all these resource links that Bill has been sharing as well as some others that will be up uh, later today. Again, we're gonna miss you, Sam. So we bid you adieu and I'll cry. Um, but uh, folks at the mothership are gonna be very happy when they see you there. And then just the very last thing, uh, do not forget, I will have a post up shortly about next week's Midday Cafe, where we're gonna have Mr. Dan Holm talking about communities within the Microsoft 365 framework. That is a must-see uh, event as well, and we wanna thank everybody for attending. And again, Bill, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot, Mike. It's been uh, really fun. Sorry I talked so fast, so much oh, stuff. Um, and like I said, we, we we barely, you know, we barely crack the tip of the iceberg um, related to some of the stuff that we're doing with search. So you can kind of think about this as being the one on one. Um, you know, so many cool things coming. I, I think search for the longest time has kind of been perceived as, yeah, it's a thing. Um, you know, it's funny when you take it away, it's kind of that you don't know what you got until it's gone. Um, I'm not going to sing it for you. I could, but I won't. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's one of those things that, you know, search becomes important the second you don't have it. Um, I, I think, you know, our idea is, you know, let's let's really make search a fundamental part of how you work every day. You know, let's let's help it facilitate productivity. Let's, you know, help address some of the challenges we face with remote work by making information more discoverable, by making the people connection, people centricity. Um, and then, uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff, you know, coming down the roadmap. I, I think, you know, the pandemic shifted a lot of our work, but in, in more or less a positive way, because the way I kind of describe search, you know, is it's basically now the digital water cooler um, inside of a lot of organizations. So really pleased that you had me on. Um, I could have went on for four or five hours, but uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Mike. I'm sure we'll connect soon. Um, at the very least. And, and then Sam, I look forward to seeing you uh, here at the Mothership. Weather is lovely. <laughs> That's what I've heard. <laughs> and he's being yeah, facetious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll need lots of this. Yeah. Coffee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for joining. We're going to sign off until next time, next Monday, again with Dan Holm talking Microsoft communities. Join us at aka.ms 
slash HLS blog. We look to see you and thank you for joining Midday Cafe. Have a great one, everyone. Yep. Jazz hands. Bye.